All right, shall we start? Can everyone hear me okay? Now that you're listening to my throat, not necessarily my voice. I have the, uh, the benefit and the curse of being a native English speaker. So if I speak very fast and you don't understand me, please say something. How many people know about Tor? By raise of hands. How many people have Tor installed? How many people use Tor daily? OK. <laughs> You've all just de-anonymized yourself. Thank you. So let's talk about anonymity. Anonymity in the Western world has this very shadowy, scary sort of uh, impression. Um, it could also be people at the Liberty Bell with a giant onion head. And the woman to the left shocked that there's a guy with an onion head looking at her. Um, anonymity in other parts of the world isn't negative. Uh, they like being part of a crowd. They like being, being able to hide and being able to pop up as an individual when they need to. So what is anonymity not? Anonymity is not cryptography. Cryptography just protects the contents, and uh, someone can still watch who you are and what you're doing. Anonymity is not steganography. Um, even if you hide messages in the in transit, you can still tell who's talking to who and how often they talk, or at least one party is. You may not know the intended recipient. Uh, anonymity is not wishful thinking. Um, there are lots of promises. There's privacy by policy, which is most of what these are, is that you can't tell it's me. I promise not to, promise not to look at your data. I promise not to record your data. And I promise not to tell anyone else I recorded your data. I promise I didn't sign my name to it. And isn't the internet already anonymous? Well, as we'll find out. Um, you can't prove it was me. Proof is a very strong word. Statistical analysis, or the technical term is a long-term intersection attack, works very, very well. And the longer you watch someone's communications, the more likely you can determine that this was actually you, regardless of what you insist it is not. Promise you won't look, tell, remember. These are all promises. Um, you all sign contracts with your ISP, who probably says, you know, we value your privacy. We, we will never break a law. We will never sell your data accidentally. Um, I've had my identity stolen by my bank, lost their backup tapes. They promised to never give up my data whatsoever. Now some mafia person has all my personal information and my bank accounts and my life financial information because they broke a promise. Um, did they encrypt those tapes? No, of course not. Um, I promise not to remember. Many places say we don't record any information, and at least in America, there have been all sorts of data breaches where credit card information was copied off to a local system so they could do better marketing and customer analysis. Um, they promised not to remember the data either. And if you lost your credit card, you then were very upset because you had to go get another one and all this stuff. And by default, you're the criminal, not the people who lost your data. And then I promise not to tell. If someone offers you 50,000 euros to accidentally give up your web server logs or give up your transactional history, uh, that's a tough incentive to defeat. And this is also why the US is growing with these data breach notifications, because lots of companies say, you know, we, we promise not to tell anybody. Um, we promise not to lose your data. We promise to use industry standard practices. Uh, it may or may not work. I didn't write my name on it. That's not what we're talking about. That's more identity. Um, and isn't the internet already anonymous? Uh, no, no, it's not. <laughs> who needs their privacy? The vast majority of people who use Tor that I run into talking around the world are just normal, everyday people. Um, it makes lots of press when you talk about Iranian activists or Chinese activists trying to take down their government. Most of those people just want to see what the BBC said about them. They want to see what CNN. They want to see what the latest Hollywood movie is. They want to see why Dilbert was blocked and what was Dilbert what does Dilbert say today? Uh, militaries and law enforcement, um, the US Navy and other branches are big users of Tor because they realize you can't have the Navy anonymity network because then everyone realizes you're just the Navy. Um, so they treat you that way. Law enforcement, I spent most of the past year talking to law enforcement. And I've been absolutely surprised at how many law enforcement officers use Tor because they feel they need to protect themselves online. They need to protect their cases. They need to protect their families. Um, and the fact that if you come from like FBI.gov or Interpol.int, uh, criminals tend to pick up on that quickly. Uh, journalists, human rights workers, 
businesses. Another surprising is businesses. Lots of lawyers use Tor. They use Tor so that when they go out to do investigations, they're not coming from like lawfirm.com or something. And they can be more anonymous and they can do get, I guess, different ethical concerns resolved. So anonymous communications. An enemy loves company. You can't be the only person using Tor in your entire country or you stand out because you're the only person using Tor. Um, there are countries in the world where we have between one and 10 Tor users and we tell them to at least coordinate and get all on, on the same time because um, otherwise you stand out as a sore thumb as I'm the only guy who ever used Tor. So they pretty much can figure out, they may not know where you're going, but they know where you started off and they know you're using Tor. <laughs> and they can just beat it out of you anyway. Um, the basic idea is hiding in the crowd. Uh, so I'm the only person in a fluorescent green t-shirt here. Um, so I would, not, I would stand out in the crowd, except you in the green sweatshirt. Um, you and I would, sta would, would stand out in the crowd of everybody else. Uh, the idea is to look like everybody else. There's a thing with Panopticlick, with EFF's Panopticlick browser identification. The whole idea about that is that it shows you how unique your browser print is against everyone else on the web. All the Tor users should look the same. So we look unique, but we all look the exact same to everybody else. Uh, Tor is not the first system. It won't be the last um, when Tor dies at some point or becomes illegal or becomes so popular everyone uses it. There'll be other systems that say, you know, let's do the anti-anonymity. Let's do more um, dark nets. Uh, yeah. There's a difference between high latency and low latency. Low latency systems, most people don't want to wait forever for an email. They don't want to wait forever for the web page. They don't want to wait for their chat. Um, high latency systems are very resistant to, to traffic analysis. Low latency systems are, are subject to traffic analysis, traffic correlation. What is low latency versus high latency? Uh, the more interactive your app, that's low latency. If you're doing an IM, like I'm chat, you know, I chat with my daughter or something, she doesn't want to wait a day and a half for me to, to say okay. Um, well, maybe she does sometimes. Uh, video streaming, people don't want to watch videos one frame at a time every day. You get a different frame. Uh, some apps do work well. Email. There's things like Mixmaster and Mixminion that people will wait for a day, two days, three days to get their email through because they need that level of protection. Uh, some news groups, people will withstand that much of a delay to respond to threads. Blogging. A lot of bloggers actually do their work offline and then they post. So they don't mind if it takes a day or more to get their message posted. Um, if enemy loves company, the vast majority of users are in the interactive apps, so we aim for the low latency network to be more like the interactive apps. So what is TOR? Um, TOR is an acronym. It is also not an acronym. It can mean TOR is onion routing. It can mean the onion router. It can mean, I recently heard South African police called it the onion ring. Um, and it can also mean uh, telescoping onion routing. Um, You'll often see it written in the press as capital T-O-R, meaning the onion router, but it actually doesn't have an acronym. Uh, we are an online anonymity software and network. We are three clause BSD licensed in GPLv2. Uh, everything we do is open source, transparent. You can ask us um, anything about the Tor. We've written down the specs, so you can build your own compatible Tor clients based on the Tor protocol if you don't trust any of our code. Uh, other people have done this. And we actively encourage the research community to attack us. Um, we figure that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And most of the research community that does try to break Tor, they do successfully break Tor, and then they come up with a fix, or they won't get their thesis approved, um, and they won't get their degree, and that makes them sad. Um, there are plenty of other people out there who attack Tor, and then they go talk at a security conference and say, I can attack Tor in three packets. And then they realize that, well, it's a 10-year-old attack. Five other people have done this presentation. But security conferences seem to have a short memory, and they'll get a lot of press about this. Um, and sometimes they'll also say, well, I can emulate the man if I control all the Tor nodes in my, in my virtual machine. Well, yes, you can, because if you can watch all the traffic in and out, then you win. If you can watch all the traffic in and out of the entire internet, which there are many uh, national security agencies rumored to be able to do this, um, then you may also win. We have a growing list of stuff. 
Um, we started off with Tor, which is the Tor, the actual routing daemon client. And now we have a vast um, number of projects that people show up and say, hey, I did this for my PhD thesis, and I'm giving you all the code, and good luck. Um, we've also developed a lot of things to make Tor easier to use. There's this Videlia controller, hence the onion thing. Um, and Videlia is a GUI point and click. Uh, Voice of America actually funded this because going to the countries they were interested in, um, giving people a command line tool and says, here's a config file, here's your, here's your command line, just completely freaked everybody out. Um, so we made this little pretty GUI app that you can point and click and has a red, yellow, and green onion so you can tell how Tor is doing, if it's connected, if it's not. And then we have a bunch of other stuff. Um, Orbot is actually the newest thing we have and it's Android compatible Tor. Um, the issue with that is, so great, you have Tor running your Android phone. Um, nothing uses a proxy on the Android. So you can host a hidden service, because you can get service servers running on Android. And now you have this Orbot thing that can talk Tor, and you can connect to hidden services. Um, so we're working on a browser, we're working on figuring out the rest of the environment. So who actually runs Tor Project? About three years ago, um, we started taking donations before that. I've been a volunteer for about five or six years, and we were just a bunch of guys, and apparently you can't fund just a bunch of guys. Um, you need to fund an actual entity. So we created the Tor Project Inc. It is, in US terminology, a 501c3 nonprofit, which means your donations are tax deductible. This is not a sales pitch, I'm just telling you. Um, we're founded to do research and development for online anonymity and privacy. And part of the reason we went nonprofit rather than for profit, uh, my background is venture capital, and there are lots of VCs who wanted to fund us to do, you know, make tour the biggest in America, whatever. Um, but we believe we wanted to save the world. So we wanted to do everything transparent. Everything we publish is transparent. Our internal schedules are transparent. Who works for us is transparent. How much they get paid, um, when they get paid is transparent. And it also helps that. Many people don't want to volunteer for a for-profit company, to a degree, and we need, we need the volunteers to run the Tor network. We don't actually want to run the Tor network for liability reasons, in that Tor is considered a common carrier in most countries, regardless of what you read in the press, and therefore, like a telephone company, you're not responsible for the content that goes across it. Tor started off, well, actually, onion routing started off at the Office of Naval Research in the 1990s. Um, the Navy realized that traffic analysis was a growing concern in various realms that they deal in, where traffic analysis at the core is you watch all the communications, you figure out what the hubs are, and you take the hubs out. Um, your enemy's doing this too, so if they can't figure out where the hubs are, because everyone looks like a mesh and everyone's talking to everyone else, then uh, you've raised the bar enough that your enemy now has to go figure out some other way. Either you gotta take out everybody all at once, or you, you know, do whatever else it takes to infiltrate an organization. They quickly realized that you can't have the Navy anonymity network, because then it would all be Navy personnel, and you'd be treated as a military uh, counterpart. So they open sourced it, public domained it, and uh, the US government actually holds a patent on onion routing, the original, original idea of onion routing. And because it's the US government, it's public domain, and you know, they, they don't sell it, they don't do anything like that with it. Uh, we say it's privacy by design in that we don't record logs, we don't have any promises to break because we don't have your data. Um, by default, the Tor software doesn't record any sort of personally identifiable information as for any strict definition of personally identifying. Uh, it supports any TCP right now. We're working on UDP and possibly SCTP in the future. Um, one for performance, two because lots of people want to use UDP over Tor. And there are ways to tunnel UDP through TCP, but those are messy. And over the past year, we've been sort of thrust into the limelight as activists around the world have picked up on Tor to circumvent national firewalls, because the properties of breaking apart who you are from where you're going on the internet seems to work well. I've also talked to lots of, lots of bankers who use Tor, not because they want to defraud their bank, but because they want to get to Gmail to go check their mail, to go check their calendar, to see what time they have to pick their kids up from school or from soccer practice or something. And they just, you know, they turn it on when they need it, they turn it off when they don't need it. Uh, one key difference is that we have a set of seven directory authorities, 
directory authorities are kind of like the root DNS servers, that they publish a consensus um, of all the relays in the network, and that's what your client downloads. We haven't done a distributed hash table yet, even though there are many designs out there, because there's partitioning attacks where if you start breaking the DHT up, different people see different parts of the network, and then you can start to win as to profiling clients. Uh, what is Tor composed of? Primarily C. Um, I, didn't, I couldn't get the graph from earlier, but in around 2005, we were like 30,000 lines of code. Um, after lots of researchers and other people have committed to the code base, we have around 15 core committers and around 2,000 other volunteers between running relays, helping out with translations, helping out with documentation. Um, and we've recently picked up a few people who are very good at videos. So we started putting together videos about how to use Tor, because people seem to like watching a video about how do I install Tor versus reading through, reading through the instructions. Um, the, uh, the tech LaTeX there <coughs> are because we document everything we do, and because we come from academia, we tend to use LaTeX for everything. Um, we write a lot. <laughs> So in a nutshell, how does Tor work? The blue cloud is the internet. You as a Tor user, you have Tor software installed on your laptop, and you want to get to your web server. Um, terminology is entry node, middle node, exit node. The entry node is your first connect to. There's also guard nodes to protect you from attacks where you can watch, just pick up traffic over time and start noticing trends. And the exit node is where you actually exit the Tor network. You build an encrypted tunnel from your client, so everything is encrypted as, as it goes into Tor, or leaves Tor into the network, through the network, and if, you're, if your traffic originally was encrypted, like HTTPS, IMAPS, POP3S, uh, then it comes out that way. We are a tunnel, we don't touch your traffic at all, we just wrap it in encryption and relay it around the world. Uh, there have been press stories about people, particularly this guy in Sweden, who set up an exit node, recorded all his traffic, and said, look, I have uh, embassies and all this stuff using these, um, one, he found out the hard way that was illegal and that the Swedish police came and arrested him and no one's heard from him since um, because you can't wiretap because he's not a telco. And two, most of the accounts that he thought he had were actually criminals watching, the other, watching these accounts anyway. Um, he, also broke, he also disclosed some police investigations which were watching fake accounts, <laughs> which is really what he got in trouble for. So how many people use Tor? Well, it's an anonymity system. We don't, ask, we don't ask. We don't ask for demographics. You don't have to register. We don't record anything on our web servers. Um, as a US company, not recording anything on our web servers gets us around US export laws um, so far. Uh, as soon as we start recording IP addresses and start re doing a registration, then we have to block all the bad countries for whatever the US considers bad. Um, however, we do disclose everything we, we record. Everything we recorded about Tor is published on metrics. Um, we have another site called Archive that is copies of the directory authorities' consensus files from every hour of every day for the past seven years. Um, it's around 25 gigs compressed. It's around a couple hundred gigs uncompressed. And a few organizations have started looking at that to look through to see, are there anonymity attacks here? Are we giving out more information than we need? Um, and we look forward to their research. However, Mozilla does spy on you. Um, this is from the Tor Button dashboard. We've made it completely public so everyone can see what's being recorded about you inside Mozilla. Um, if you have Tor Button installed and have checked, check for version updates, it will re dutifully report to Mozilla over Tor that you have Tor Button installed, here's the version, and here's how many daily users you have. Um, this is undercounting. Lots of people don't use, Mo don't use Firefox. Um, and there are a lot more devices out there that have Tor embedded in them. So roughly half a million daily users seems right. Um, you may have noticed Tor is slow at times, all the time. Um, it's getting faster. One is because we have like half a million people using 2,000 servers. In reality, you have half a million people using 2,000 servers trying to go through 500 exit nodes. So the exit nodes become the bottleneck because you get this swell of traffic going into them. And We've had millions of people download it, and the common use case is you download it, you use it when you need it, and then you turn it off when you don't need it. Uh, some other features are 
hidden services. Um, the Finnish Defense Department actually wrote and funded most of this hidden services stuff because they wanted a way to host location independent um, sites, services, chats. Uh, so the dot .onion domain is what we use, is what they use internally. The uh, way it basically works is your client, so you, Tor clients can also run hidden services. It doesn't have to be a relay. Um, so if you have millions of clients, we probably have millions of hidden services. I know I personally have hidden services for all my SSH stuff. So when I'm traveling, like on this wireless here, um, I can just SSH into my hidden service node as opposed to going to an actual IP4, IPv4 address. Uh, WikiLeaks has used this successfully. Many of you must know about WikiLeaks. For, you, know, you can publish documents from whistleblowers and more transparency. Um, someone inside the Ministry of Defense leaked the How to Leak Stop Leaks document, which obviously <laughs> no one read that document. Um, WikiLeaks is the most obvious example. There are other examples where human rights organizations will work in country, and even the fact that they are in country is enough to get their activists arrested. So they'll use a hidden service with some sort of out-of-band authentication, whether it's SMS or you know, here's a secret passphrase, so that people in country can report in, and they know who they are, roughly, but there's no trace of them actually going to a site that any sort of sensor will notice. Um, because Tor looks like SSL talking to their normal website, no one would, would ever think that anything's going on. So how is Tor different? Why do we use three relays? Uh, this classic design for proxy servers, you have a single, single big machine somewhere in the world. Maybe this is your brother running this because he, he moved to America um, or Europe. Maybe it's some company you trust and you know, Alice and Bill can talk to each other all day long and it's great. It's fast. Um, they're not worried about it. Maybe Alice is behind some sort of restrictive firewall. She can get by it. They can talk to Bill. Um, the issue is if that relay goes evil for some definition of evil, meaning they, ac they accidentally recorded all your traffic and then they lost it or sold it. Um, the company is actually a government front and they want to record everything you do just so they can go back at you for a history. Um, or maybe your brother decides that he's going to sell your traffic because he needs the money. It doesn't matter. The big machine somewhere in a data center can be wiretapped, meaning that the government or anybody, corrupt criminals do this too, um, corrupt ISPs do this too, where they'll just record all the traffic in and out. Traffic confirmation tax very well. Say, so, you know, I saw you go to Facebook because Facebook looked like this going in and you went like this going out. Um, if you're using unencrypted protocols, they can also grab all your username and passwords, all the text you're going back and forth, um, what you search for, and everything else that relay. So what does all this matter? So we have this cool anonymity network. Lots of researchers use it. Um, Lots of hackers and other people like to hack at it and play with it. And some people use it for hidden services. Uh, the mass majority of people seem to use it for anti-censorship. The core of this comes from Article 19 and 20. You have the right to freedom of expression. You have the right to freedom of assembly. Uh, George Orwell was an optimist, as it's turning out. He imagined many people cutting up newspaper archives. Um, that only scales so well. He could never imagine that millions of computers would be able to do this vastly faster than he could. And John Gilmore said, well, the net intercept censorship is damages and routes around it. Uh, not so much true anymore. Ask the people in China, um, ask the people in Australia who are about to get lots of censorship, and they can't route around it because the censorship's in the routers. They control the IPs, they control the domains that, you, that you're allowed to see. Um, Almost every country in the world is implementing some sort of censorship regime. And, and first off, it comes to protect the children. Um, I can tell you from lots of law enforcement talks that they tell you that these block lists for protecting the children are where porn was, not where it is and not where it's going. Um, so you have this growing list of websites that are for children to protect children, to stop gambling, to stop bad phishing targets. Um, and talking to Richard Clayton last night, you know, again, by the time something gets into a block list, for a national block list, it's already been passed. The criminals already moved on. So now you're just blocking whoever the unlucky person is to get that domain or that IP address. On a social level, uh, people still are willing to work around it. Um, there is a chilling effect that as people get picked up, especially like in Iran, we saw this, where people would go to Twitter or people would go to Facebook to say, here's where we're going to organize. And then that person gets picked up, all your friends go, whoa, what is this? 
I can't do this. Um, I can't afford to be beaten up. I can't afford to be arrested. Governments are monitoring the internet um, a lot. Every organization, every government has a internet surveillance plan. Um, there are different names up there for what it's called. The idea is to record all the data about you just in case you might be a criminal. Um, the analog I heard was actually from a Jacques, I want to say is Veras from the DG JLS on Thursday. And he said basically the police are coming to him saying that in the old world, in the physical world, I can watch somebody. I can record what they do, and I have a history. And there's a history that can be recreated based on who saw who doing what, and then a crime was committed. So I can build up a, the history into that crime, and then I can go forward and watch them completely. The and they want the same thing on the internet. The difference is, in the real world, you have this sort of freeze situation where as soon as someone is suspected of a crime, then you can tell them. Then you can record what they do, who they call, how often they talk to people, where they go for their coffee in the morning. On the internet, you can do that all the time. You can record everybody, every last detail, down to infinitely degrees of timing, and get all their information just in case. And because computers make it vastly easier to update, you can sort through this in this massive haystack you've built um, just in case people might be criminals. And this it understandably freaks out a lot of people. Uh, this is equivalent of the, the Stasi becoming robots, so that seven of seven Germans are, East Germans are Stasi. If anyone recognizes that room, that's the NSA wiretap room. Um, some countries, and yes, I've said this to people in the US, some countries um, obey their laws and roll out the uh, various bills that force you to record the internet. Others of them do warrantless wiretapping, which is record everything, um, just because they can. Uh, the core traffic data silences is who talks to who, how often they talk, how much data they send. That's all you need to do to pick up networks of people. When the former director of the Interception Modernization Program in the UK says, you know, wait, what are we doing here? Um, that should be assigned to people. When, when your own internal people start freaking out saying, holy crap, look at all the stuff we're recording about these people. Um, you can rebuild my entire friendship, social networks, and everything. And that's what it looks like. Um, there's a fine paper in the economics of mass surveillance and how absolutely cheap it is to surveil everybody all the time and build really cool social network maps. Um, this is actually from mailing lists and of uh, different mailing list people and who overlaps who and who talks to who. And the issue with this is maybe, maybe you're not worried about your social graph, but many places will say, all right, so one of these red dots goes, becomes a terrorist cell or becomes a child porn sale, or becomes a gambling site. Um, is everyone associated with it now guilty? In many countries, the answer is yes. And there we go. We have some fans who create some graphics for us. Um, you can rejoice in anonymity. And getting involved as volunteer. We have a fine, long volunteer page of here's the technical projects, here's advocacy projects, here's anything you can do to help people around the world. And that's it. <clears throat> Any questions? How to best convince a wife, mother, or other non-technical family member that they should be using Tor? Uh, well, so believe it or not, I don't force Tor on my wife and daughter either. <clears throat> I let them make out, I let, I'm basically letting Facebook and the banks who lose all your data and everyone else freak, freak them out so they realize they should do something. Um, I've talked to some cancer victims who, you know, either they or their loved ones get, find out they have cancer, they go start Googling for stuff, and all these ads show up about here's all the treatments, and they go into Gmail, and they get all these, you know, pharmaceutical ads. And then they start realizing that for a while, all the results are sort of sorted based on here's your pharmaceutical stuff. And that's typically enough to freak people out, um, that they start worrying about you know, what's going on. In the US and other countries that don't have sort of nationalized health care, you can lose your job if you find that you have a condition that's very expensive. Um, the incentives aren't quite there yet. There's been lots of research by uh, Alessandro Acquisti 
out of CMU in Pittsburgh who's doing work on incentives for privacy and how much people will pay for privacy, how much they won't. Um, I used to worry about how, how would we tell people to worry about these things, and it seems the commercial industry is doing just fine and the government industry is doing just fine. I think most people who use Tor now are sort of early adopters. Um, my grandmother had her computer broken into, turned into a bot, and she fished and spammed like thousands of people. And I apologize for that if you're a part of that. But um, she didn't know. She got this cool crossword thing. And so she ran this application that gave her a cool crossword puzzle. Um, it just happened to infect her. <clears throat> um, she worried about what information they had. And then she independently started searching for like VPNs or you know, privacy tools to protect ourselves online. As the world gets more and more online, and as you have things like data retention, um, people start to worry about the trail they leave. And it's nothing I found I can't convince someone who doesn't, who doesn't already worry about their privacy to run tour until they have something happen. They have the, uh, you know, the holy cow moment. Thank you. As a Tor user, I've uh, observed that there are few exit nodes and the major problem is as people try more and more to use Tor, Tor is getting slower and slower. Have you any plans of increasing the number of exit nodes? Uh, there, there are some uh, things we can do yep. to increase this number. Thank you. Yeah, so we have multiple plans. One. When we first designed Tor, we figured, ah, eh, we'll worry about it when it gets to half a million users. We're now at half a million users. There's a lot of protocol designs we need to do to make things faster. We have a fine 27-page performance roadmap that we wrote up that goes in excruciating detail down to we multiplex TCP streams. We don't queue busy streams versus less busy streams, meaning if you're file sharing over Tor, you hog lots of bandwidth, and the IM users who only need tiny, <coughs> who only need tiny little bits get pushed out. Um, we're going to start this year a Relays for Tor campaign, where the first step of that was to get the legal protections in place. Um, many people would run exit nodes if they know there's help available for if, if someone does something bad through your IP address, that has the most chilling effect, where uh, if someone you know, fishes a site or does whatever, gambling fraud or something through your Tor exit node, the police come and knock on your door, if you're lucky, and say, you know, we think your IP address did something bad. Um, we have a growing number of law firms around the world who will give free help or at least give you directions to the people who can help you to say, well, here's how to defend against this. You have a civil right to run these things. Your IP address is personally identifiable. Um, they can't just give it out anywhere. And it's not you. Tor is treated like a telephone company where they're not responsible for the content, just the delivery. Hello. Just one back here. <clears throat> Hello. Lots of great examples uh, you give, you know, for, I guess, what I would think of as positive uses of Tor in terms of, ah, uh, you know, uh, anonymizing people that are doing good work, you know, fighting oppression in, in, in countries, say. But from an ethical perspective, my, my interest would be whether you think, on balance, it's used ethically for things that many people would consider good versus bad. You know, because when you choose to, to use your computer as an exit node, you're making, I guess, an ethical choice that you are going to hide people and maybe you want, you know, maybe it's good to hide U.S. military personnel from being blown up. Other people disagree. But, I mean, at least, what is your sense of the balance of use of Tor? Is it typically pornography? Or is it typically, you know, um, worthy human rights activists? Or is it typically military <coughs> spies? Or, you know, ethically, how do you persuade people to use their computer to support Tor? Uh, so... For people who've done research on this, the vast majority of Tor traffic is absolutely mundane and boring. Um, they're, what makes the press are the people who uh, get caught for doing child porn or gambling or credit card fraud. And no one ever hears about, you know, user browse BBC successfully. No one cares. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of expected. The, do criminals use Tor? Of course they do. Criminals also use cell phones, cars, highways, digital cameras, and all this other stuff. Um, they use email. The 9-11 hijackers use Hotmail um, quite successfully. And we generally say, like any technology, um, we promote the good uses. It's an infrastructure. It's anonymizing layer on the internet. And we just let it, the whole point is to let it look like the internet. Um, internet traffic is like some percentage of porn, some percentage of normal usage, some percentage of bots, some percentage of criminals. 
and that's I mean, as best I can tell you, is that we, we're here to promote the good uses. We do work with law enforcement. When law enforcement comes to us and says, you know, so-and-so threatened to kill his wife, um, and he used, he used a tour posting, they generally have a profile, and they can start figuring things out. Um, Old-fashioned police techniques work well, because criminals have to be lucky all the time. Police have to be lucky once. There have been lots of cases where criminals slip up, forget to turn on tour, use a real IP address, and it takes a shockingly short amount of time for someone under, already under suspicion to get arrested. Does that answer your question? Yes, no? Mostly? <laughs> Anyone else? Hello. Uh, I have a question. Um, well, Tor is nice, but why do you list the exit nodes? Like, I have a site here with 2,112 exit nodes, uh, meaning, well, if I go to some forums where I will say, uh, hey, you're on a Tor node, uh, well, you can't post. Bye-bye. So uh, how does that uh, enhance the anonymity to list the nodes, actually? I don't get that. So a number of sites, and I'll pick on Wikipedia, um, block the internet based on IP because they assume an IP is a person. Unfortunately, when they block IP addresses from posting, they've blocked all of AOL and most ISPs that NAT everyone to death. Um, we are working on systems. One of the tools up there were, was called Nimble. Um, Nimble is a pseudonym system that you do some sort of computation and prove that you're you. You get a nonce, and the nonce is then what you use to log into the websites. Um, these are very much in design and in research, but you know, we realize this concern exists. And as people, it, the same concern with websites that is, like Freenode has a sort of hidden service uh, GPG-based identity that you can prove that, you know, here's who I am. I've done sort of some sort of computation. And this identity is valid until I turn into a jerk. Then you can block that identity. And it's difficult enough that you can't just create thousands of them and spam everybody. Anybody else? Another question? Yeah. Uh, do you know if anyone is building an anonymous or pseudonymous payment system on top of this? I know that people have thought about it and are thinking through incentives. Um, some of the concerns, some of the research challenges actually are with incentive systems. You'd be very careful what you incent. Um, there is a technology called, I think it's called BitBlinder, um, that's basically for anonymous file sharing. And they have some sort of payment structure where for every byte you transmit, you get two free bytes or something like that. And they've created all sorts of incentives for people that run really, really fast nodes for a short bit of time to get twice the amount of bandwidth, and then they shut it down. Um, as for actual like e-cash type things, uh, I know those are in research. I don't think anyone's deployed like a hidden service-based e-cash system yet. Hi. I would like to know uh, if you have some, maybe some uh, more news about the recent attack from uh, um, some black hat on the Tor server? Uh, I think I got half that. Can you repeat your question? My, my question is, uh, re recently there, there were uh, uh, attacks against the uh, web server on the Tor project. And uh, maybe uh, you know uh, who is behind or why such attack occur on Tor project. Are you asking who, how do you know who runs a Tor server? The web server, the, 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 um, the host. Uh, oh, our, uh, our bandwidth hogs is what you're talking about, our public notification of the breach we had? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, we don't. We suspect they're Southern German, because the Germans who work on Tor said, this is Bavarian. No one writes like this. So either someone's very good at faking a Bavarian. Um, mostly what they attacked was spd.de. And they wanted lots of bandwidth to do a bandwidth ampl amplification attack or a DDoS. Um, we spent a lot of time and had a lot of help looking through the f doing forensic analysis of our servers. And as far as we can tell, they used some old SSH exploit on someone else's server, took the keys, um, because Tor admins, Tor people are still people. They had the private key for their SSH along with their public key. And uh, got into other servers and then installed basic um, kernel exploits to 
some, some, some are zero day, we found out, um, which may become published soon, and uh, published, used it to do band, bandwidth attacks, you know, bandwidth intensive attacks. Um, all the forensics point to that they didn't realize what they broke into. They just saw, look, here's some servers on some gigabit links. Woohoo, I can go attack things really quickly now. Um, they didn't touch any of the Tor code. We had two people go through every git commit, every SVN commit, compared to what was in the repository, compared to what, you know, we send emails out when that happens, compared their own trees, and looked through every last bit for, you know, the past two years to see if anything changed. Um, one of our volunteers, who's a student um, in Germany, went through every single git commit ever and compared everything to make sure that what, what changed was actually what was supposed to change and no one went through and modified the archives. And so basically, I mean, one, we got lucky. Um, two, they, they just wanted, they were basically silly attackers and wanted bandwidth and took advantage of, you know, volunteer and other servers that were related to her. Mm, yeah, I mean, uh, Tor is a great project about uh, privacy and everything like this. And, uh, but uh, there, there were some other party who don't like uh, the, the point of view of Tor and Tor yep. user. And uh, do you think uh, with uh, maybe the widely uh, range of user, there will be also widely more attack like uh, this kind of? Uh, do we expect to get attacked more? Yes. Um, as activists around the world have used Tor to, you know, actively speak out against their government, you know, this attracts a different level of uh, attention that we're not quite used to, um, and we're working through um, securing our systems and doing things sort of more securely, vastly more securely, so that as we get these attacks from like nation level um, espionage and other services that we can at least detect them and hopefully defend against them. So ex to exit nodes are um, in fact being uh, wiretapped. So using Tor would increase the chances of you being, uh, of your uh, communications being followed. Uh, do you know if this is correct? And if so, wouldn't that mean that you would only want to pass uh, encrypted traffic through uh, Tor? Uh, we encourage people to use encrypted traffic, period, whether you use Tor or not. Um, are you likely to be more wiretapped? Uh, it's unclear. I mean, right now, most law enforcement, you, don't, you have to have a reason to wiretap somebody, and there's all sorts of precautions in place, and then they, they may or may not be able to analyze that much data that comes out. So I, I think the answer right now is no. Could it be in the future? Maybe. Um, as laws come into effect, when the... Uh, when the IPRED law came into effect in Sweden, we saw Tor usage from Sweden go up by 50%. You know, like other VPN providers saw their, their subscriptions skyrocket um, the day before. So you, you, know, you put the laws in place and you just created this arms race of people trying to avoid being wiretapped, whether it's at a nation level or individual level. Uh, did, every, <coughs> did anyone in the Western world ever got sued for running a Tor exit note? Uh, they're not for running a Tor exit node, no. They've been taken to court. There's a guy, Morphium, from Germany, um, who had his exit node, did something bad. Police came and collected his computer, and then he became much more of an activist because his attitude was, well, you know, screw them. Um, they're going to do this to me. Watch me. I'm going to run five exit nodes. Not only does, does he run more exit nodes, he now runs WikiLeaks.de and a bunch of other things, and he keeps winning cases that basically... Um, what he's doing is nothing more than telcos do, like the ISPs and the telephone companies do, so why should he be picked on? Um, he will also run, you know, very open exit policies to attract more traffic just to sort of, because he, he wants to have the fights. So the answer right now is no. Not for, Tor is not illegal anywhere in the world, as far as we know. Maybe North Korea, but North Korea has no internet. And when you browse, when you go to the internet cafe in North Korea, you have an 18-year-old with an M16 sitting behind you, ready to shoot you if you do something bad. So that's a pretty good incentive not